tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 10, Episode 21. I'm your host, Otis Gyrie, and in this episode, I'll be performing three tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Seth Hall, about dangerous drunks, perilous parks, and grim guardians. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the Moonlit Trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by June's Journey. We all have that one friend. Or are you that one friend who can pretty much find anything about anyone through social media magic? And if you're guilty of the same, you don't have to hide. I don't bring it up to shame you. I mention it because it proves that everyone it's a little detective itch. They like to scratch. It's in that vein that I wanted to thank our friends at Wooga and their June's Journey app for sponsoring this and so many other episodes. Never get tired of a good whodunit? Then you'll love June's Journey. You play as June Parker, an amateur detective investigating a series of mysteries full of twists and turns around every corner. You'll put your powers of observation to the test, sharpen your sleuthing skills, and relish the thrill of solving the case. June's journey will have you collecting evidence and solving mysteries in endlessly beautiful scenes from around the world. It's a brain booster, testing your observational skills and putting your power of recall to the test. With every level, you collect coins and rewards, earn upgrades, and unlock new scenes to explore. It's the rare breed of game that keeps you glued to the screen. You'll always want to play just a little more, because after all, there is a detective in all of us. Find your inner detective. Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. We begin this evening with what some of you may have encountered in your lives. Someone who just can't take a hint and go away. You meet them somewhere, like a convention, 
or hotel buffet breakfast, and they suddenly think you're their new best friend. But in our first tale of the evening, some take the attention just a little too far. Without further ado, I present to you a couple drinks. I was minding my own business, just watching the game on the big TV in the bar corner, when he bumped into me and got beer on my sleeve. I didn't know who he was. I just heard the grumbling excuses as he apologized. I just texted home that I wouldn't be too late, but I'd probably have to run the laundry. I came back with a roll of paper towels from the counter to wipe my sleeve off. I just waved them off and said it wasn't a big deal. It took him a little while, but he finally got the point and went off on his merry way for a few minutes. Hey, I'm sorry again. Didn't mean to get you all wet. I just saw this seat wasn't taken. All right, if I sit here for a bit. I'm expecting some people, and I, I didn't want to miss the end of the game. I shrugged. I was mostly here just to enjoy myself after a long week at work. All my friends were busy with long work days or family this Friday. We didn't always go to the sports bar to watch games, but I just felt like being out tonight. Nobody at home would mind. The in-laws had stopped visiting, so my presence wouldn't be missed. Of course, that also meant I didn't have anyone to chat with other than the bartender. She wasn't exactly chatty tonight for whatever reason. He sat down. He was probably uh, in his thirties, with a plain white short-sleeved t-shirt and jeans. He had a beard, but the way it stuck out in places and whirled uncontrollably, it was like he was trying it out for the first time. He kept playing with it, like my little girl would do with her hair when she got nervous. I haven't seen you around here before, you knew? I shook my head. At least three years off and on. Oh, then it must be me who's new. With that, he gave a wheezy, wide-mouthed laugh that ended in a big cough, one he thankfully turned toward the empty side of the counter. He slapped the table. So, got any money on this one? I gripped my beer a little more tightly. Sure, I was hoping for a little chat, seemed like the type of guy whose idea of a pleasant chat was about 20 decibels higher than I could stand. No, but uh, if I had bet against the Lakers, I'd feel pretty good now. Hell yeah! Screw the Lakers! Pompous assholes. A few other faces in the bar looked over in our direction, while the guy gave some of them a puzzled look. What? I'm the only one who thinks so? Come on, most of you are thinking it. He leaned in close to me. I slid aside about an inch to avoid his beard rubbing on my ear. Way it is, you know? Most people don't say what they think. Don't have the balls to do it. You would have thought he would have said this quietly, but he didn't. I was glad I pulled my head back when I did, because he would have loudly proclaimed this right into my brain. A guy at the other end of the bar, probably the same age as us, but looked older due to total baldness, gave me the finger. Hey, pal, tell your friend over there to shut up, will you? They don't all want commentary tonight. I was about to tell him this guy wasn't my friend, but the bearded interloper waved a finger at him. Hey, hey, I can be calm, I can be quiet. You ask nice. Don't talk that way to my man here. He didn't do anything wrong. The night went on like this. The guy kept talking to me, asking all kinds of questions about basketball and regaling me with little fun facts about things I'd never even heard about. We did have some small talk I was interested in about some of the classic 80 Pistons lineup, especially Lambeer who I admit I was a fanboy of, even though I would never go near Detroit if it paid me. But then he moved on to baseball, which wasn't my thing at all. When the Lakers game ended, they moved on to some bowling thing that I didn't have the patience to try and follow. 
No, the company that made Louisville Slugger Bats doesn't own the rights to the name anymore. Shame, isn't it? Got bought out by Wilson. You don't even get to keep the name all those years. The more it went on, the more and more alcohol went down. And soon it overpowered his deodorant, and whatever it was he had on, and I was forced to have beer breath, sliding down my neck with every sentence he uttered. It put me off getting drunk completely. My one beer finished. The next thing I had was a rum and coke and left it at that. All that money burning a hole in my pocket, and I didn't want to spend it at all because this schmuck suddenly decided I was his companion for the night. Oh, I just realized I've been talking, and I don't think I ever introduced myself. Call me Gary. He extended a hand. I shook it. Good to meet you, Gary. I looked at the clock. Weren't you expecting people a little while ago? I hope you didn't miss them. Oh, yeah. He looked around, then reached into his pocket and checked his phone. Cripes, as if he wasn't annoying enough, he had the same model phone as me. I mean, it was pure coincidence, but still, it felt like he was trying so hard to be a copy of me that I couldn't help but roll my eyes. No, nobody here yet. I wonder what's keeping them. I shrugged, but at the same time, I couldn't imagine why anyone wouldn't want to hang out with a winner like this. Anyway, uh, you got kids? Uh, a few. Well, one, but he didn't have to know that. Got none myself. Always wanted them, though. I'd like to think if I'd made a few different choices, I would have been the perfect dad. Your kids think about that? About you? I certainly hope so. Hey, I'm going to hit the bathroom maybe call it a night. You take it easy, okay, Gary? I got up and strolled over to the bathroom. It was so strange, trying to make my way to the bathroom while being completely sober. Usually, a couple of drinks made the whole floor wobble in a way I'd been used to, but now it just felt sad. I went up to the huge urinal trough that constituted the bathroom in this place and aimed for a few pieces of ice off to the side when the door opened. I rolled my eyes when a Familiar figures sidled up to me, unzipped, and started going. Heck, women are happy they don't have to deal with this. Hey, you think maybe they do? I'm guessing sitting on the ice would have uh, not been a lot of fun. I sighed, went to wash my hands, and was barely back out on the main floor before pulling out a couple of dollars, hoping to settle up my tab and just get out of here. Even though she didn't return it, I gave the bartender a friendly wave and pushed my way out into the cold fall night outside. The bar parking lot was sparsely lit, but enough to see my car the short distance away that I parked. Technically, it was the CVS parking lot, which butted up to the bar by way of a large yellow barrier that would rip your car in half if you tried to drive from one lot to the other. But since I had a good pair of working legs to step over it, and no desire to park in a lot next to a bunch of untrustworthy drunks on the night of a ball game like that, I didn't have an issue being there. It wasn't 24 hours, anyway, so it wasn't like I was bothering anyone. I was halfway there when I heard it. Hey, heading home already? Oh, God. I spun to meet him, almost out of breath, just stepping off the sidewalk. Uh, yeah, going home. Have a nice night. Uh, you, you wouldn't happen to be heading my way, would you? My friends just buzzed, said they wouldn't be able to make it. I don't think I'm in any shape to dr to dr Without finishing his sentence, he vomited. A big, long stream, nearly hitting my shoes. I stepped back, only catching a little splatter. But thankful, I'd sent home word that I'd need the laundry. I don't know what he'd eaten before he'd started drinking, but the smell was positively ghastly, and I was no stranger to throw up. Between Friday night drinking sessions and my daughter being homesick with a stomach bug, I was used to it, but this, this was almost unholy. There was no way he was going in my car. Oh, hey, guessing we probably don't live in the same direction, man. 
sorry, I'd, I'd get an Uber or a cab if I were you. I'm sure they'll be able to help. You don't need the app? I don't have an account, and I don't know if, if they even have cabs around here. He threw up again. Good grief, he didn't need a ride. He needed a gastroenterologist for whatever died in his stomach. Well, maybe we can see if... Oh, thanks, friend, I appreciate it. You've been pretty good to me. I just need to grab some stuff from the car before I go. No, wait, I didn't say I was... But Gary already had his mind made up about an agreement we didn't have. While he was in his car, I would just go inside and get someone to call him a ride. He was parked maybe halfway in the main lot, driving an old beat-up sedan that I wouldn't have expected somebody his age to have. It looked older than I was, with rust around the trunk edges. He didn't even need a key to open it. He pounded on it a few times and popped open. It looked like he was getting a backpack or something. The bar door opened, and I could see the guy who had told Gary to shut up earlier wave at some departing friends before he headed in our direction. He got closer, and while Gary was still on his trunk, the guy came over and said, Jesus, pal, are you kidding me? Back a little closer to my door, why don't you? Besides being a very odd person, I then realized that Gary was not a very good driver. His car really was so close to the car next to him that a hand could barely fit through. I was surprised he didn't scrape the car with a mirror. Gary just waved him away. It's okay, I'm just getting some things and getting a ride. Ride? I don't give a rat's ass about you getting a ride. I can't get in my car, Dingleberry. Move this piece of crap before I move it for you. I shook my head. I'd stand back. He's not feeling his best right now. Almost on cue, Gary turned his head, dry heaved for a moment, then let loose another spray on the back of the guy's car. What the hell, man? He grabbed Gary by the t-shirt and, without missing a beat, decked him hard right across the cheek. I had to admit, it was a nice enough car that I probably would have been pissed off too, though I was thankful in my own mind that I had had the sense to park so far away. But still, I may not have been fond of Gary, but I didn't want to end the night watching him get the crap beat out of him. I tried to interject. Hey, um, I think this is going a little far, don't you think? The car owner pointed at me. Keep talking, pal. You're next after I'm through with him. With one hand pointing at me and the other holding Gary's t-shirt collar, he didn't see what happened next. Hell, I was watching and I barely saw it. Gary was still hanging onto the back side of the trunk, and his hand slipped inside. And when it emerged, he had something clutched in it. Whatever it was, it was small, just slightly bigger than his hand, and he rammed it into Car Guy's stomach. Then he slammed it again, and again, and again. It just kept hitting over and over. Car Guy was no longer angry, just surprised, watching as the bottom half of his shirt started turning red. He fell over, clutching at his midsection, beginning to whine as he realized just how much of his insides didn't seem to want to stay there anymore. Gary got up and started kicking him. You don't talk to my friend that way, you hear? I told you before he didn't do anything to you. He was just trying to help. On that last word, the kick connected with Car Guy's neck and his head twisted at an odd angle. And yet, as awful as the scene was, I could still hear him crying, begging for Gary to stop. I'd never been in a situation like this. I'm not a hero, I'm not a karate wizard, and I certainly wasn't armed, so all I could do was stare in disbelief as I watched what appeared to be a grown man being beaten to death by someone who'd been sitting with me all night at the bar. I looked around. No one else was in the parking lot. No one was going in or leaving the bar. There were windows in the front of the building, but all of them were drawn. While Gary was still kicking him, they slowly started to back away. They didn't seem to notice me retreating, so when I was about 15 feet away, 
I reached in my pocket for my phone. It wasn't there. I checked my other pocket. There was nothing other than my car keys. My phone must have been back in the bar. No way I could go get it now. To do it, I'd have to run back past Gary. And I was not doing that. I did the only thing I thought would work with keys in hand. I took off for my car. I hopped over the little barrier between the parking lots when I heard him. Buddy, where'd you go? You're not going to leave me hanging, are you? It couldn't have been more than a few seconds, but after I remote unlocked the car door and got it, I shut it and started fiddling with the pedal to do the automatic start. I looked up to see Gary had been a lot more alert than I'd been. He must have noticed me running a lot sooner than I thought, because he was already almost to my car. He wasn't holding a knife or anything like that. He'd traded up to something much bigger, probably something else he kept in his trunk. In the pale light of the poorly lit parking lot, I could make out the bat he was holding. He carried the wood-burnt logo of the Louisville Slugger. I thought we were pals, man. Here I go sticking up for you, and this is the thanks I get? The drunkenness he'd been showing had either worn off or had been an elaborate ruse. The way he stalked closer had no drunken shambling. He started the engine and worked to get the reverse going. As soon as the car started and the headlights flashed on, he started running, bad high, looking like he would bring it down on my hood or the windshield. I was again happy with where I parked because he didn't see the dividing barrier in the parking lot in his rage. He tripped and slammed into the concrete with a thud that I hoped meant he wouldn't be getting up soon. I hit the gas, spun the car out of the spot, and gunned it out of there. For a moment, I watched as Gary stood up and tried to give chase, but he gave up after a few seconds. I hit a few red lights, but I didn't care. I blew through a few of them, one to some honking horns, but I wasn't stopping for anyone or anything, at least until I saw the flashing lights in my rear view. The cop was ready to write me a ticket as I tried to explain what I was doing, at which point he offered me an escort back to the scene. I didn't want to go, but I decided it wouldn't be a problem when he said he was calling for backup. Nobody had ever left the bar before we returned. Gary and his car were gone. So was Car Guy. The massive pool of blood in the bashed-up vehicle next to it remained. If there was uh, some good to come out of the evening, it was that the bartender spoke up for me. She told them there was no way I was involved with this guy. She knew me, but never saw him before, and noticed he was making both me and others uncomfortable, and put out at the bar. So, no jail time for me. But I still went to the station to make a statement, and my wife was called. She couldn't find a sitter, so she and my little girl came along after her bedtime, and considering how long they kept me there, she fell asleep again, waiting. By two in the morning, I had what news they could give me. Gary's car had been found a little ways up the road. It wasn't registered to him. It belonged to a woman in her forties who had been reporting missing a county over, though nobody identified it because it was with a fake temporary license plate, paper stuck to the window. And thus, the lack of an identifying plate raised no suspicion. The trunk, though, what they found in the trunk, I won't go into detail. All I can say is, if it weren't for Car Guy, I would have been in for a world of hurt if I'd gotten any closer to that car. Not if he had planned to do with me what he had done to Car Guy. And yeah, they found him, too. It was a body bag about 30 feet off the path where the car had been abandoned. Car Guy was inside. His stomach wound was crudely stitched together, and his lips stapled shut wasn't given much more information other than they were still setting broken bones in place, considering how many there were. Yeah, the car guy was still alive after all that. We finally arrived back home at three in the morning. I carried my little girl to the front porch while my wife opened the door. I set her gently down on the front room couch while my wife groaned and talked about how tired she was. Then hugged me and said she was glad I was okay. 
I returned the sentiment, but then something hit me. Damn it. My phone. What? I think I left my phone at the bar. I'll have to call them in the morning. Oh, well, they may still be open. Let me try calling. She reached into her pocket and dialed my number. I should answer it if they've got it. And then that's when it happened. The most horrible moment of a horrible night. The moment when I grabbed a saw and spent the night in a hotel. When I heard my phone ringing from the kitchen. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by BetterHelp Online Therapy. I wanted to take a moment to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this and so many of our other episodes. They've been with us a good while now and have helped so many of our listeners along the way, not to mention myself personally. BetterHelp is online therapy that will help you deal with life's difficulties quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties, whether it be grief, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, etc. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With better help, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. Not a fan of being on screen? That's okay. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Because the last thing you need are intrusive thoughts about angles, lighting, and the clothes you're wearing while trying to talk to someone about your anxiety. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Otis Gyrie's Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash horror. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. I hope you enjoyed A Couple Drinks by Seth Paul, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Seth Paul. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash S-E-T-H dash P-A-U-L. Be sure to see his Jack Allen series of books if you like your weird with a comedy edge, or see his tale in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights anthology, Volume 1, all of which are available on Amazon now. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please leave Seth a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Gary, 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 what are we going to do with you? Can't make friends if you're putting people in body bags. You have to put them in something breathable. It's important to make good first impressions. In our second tale, we run into a grandfather who just wants to spend some time with his grandson. Finally gets the chance in the form of a trip to a theme park and its newest attraction. Well, all sounds great on paper, but is the offer really as good as it sounds? Without further ado, I present to you, Taken for a Ride. I've never really known how to connect with my grandson. Believe me, I tried. I used to think when Michael was born that he would grow up all interested in video games like his dad, my son Ben, was. 
but he was the sporting type, something that in my years of working in plumbing never really suited me. I might have been tough in that regard, but thrill-seeking was not something I was all that into. I still loved him, and he loved me, but it seemed like I shared nothing in common with him. Considering that his father and I had our differences, I wanted to make sure I could still have time with somebody in the family, and as my only grandchild, and the only one I would likely ever have, I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to bond. So, over the years, I indulged in whatever is current trend. Skateboard, snowboard, biking, and even a bungee cord. Something which definitely did not help my relationship with Ben at all, and was the only gift he ever asked me to return. But as anyone could tell you, gifts like that aren't the same as love. When Ben, his wife Maria, and Michael would come by to visit, we would have nice chats, but he was always more interested in poking around in the woods behind the house or going off to sled down the hill at Hankman's Park, a little ways down the road in the winter. I tried to show him how to do an oil change, something Ben had never been interested in, how to fix a sink, anything to try and connect. But it just felt like we were destined to be eternally distant. I never thought things would be different after watching a little TV. I may have considered myself old-fashioned to an extent, but one thing I knew I wouldn't be able to be without was something to watch, ever since I lost Patty last December. I signed up for Hulu, but didn't spring for the commercial this package. Anything that gave me a moment to use the bathroom or get a snack without pausing was a godsend and paying less for a service like that made me feel especially grateful. But we were all watching a Bob's Burgers together when a commercial came on for one of our local theme parks. Thunder Alley, it was called. The park, that is. I know there's something they do with monster trucks that's called something similar, but that's an event. This was the park itself. And I saw Michael's eyes light up. He was 12 at this point, and I know he was itching to ask if he could go. I know Ben would say no. He wasn't interested in roller coasters and flume rides and things. But the thing is, it never even struck me that I wouldn't mind that stuff at all. It was one thing to go snowboarding or skydiving or something like that, but rides were different. Sure, rides weren't 100% safe. I remember that guy getting hit in the face by the goose, but it was a contained thrill like going to the movies or, well, playing a video game. I went online to see if I could find tickets. I typed in the website and at first I wasn't too thrilled. The website looked slopped together like something that would have been around when AOL was still a big thing. Weird, bright colored squares, ugly text, and a few pictures of the park and the hours. But the only thing I could find about tickets was a little box that asked me for my email address to send updates, coupons, and notifications. Well, my email had filters and stuff. If I got an extra email asking me to wire my bank account information overseas, it would just be another thing to read before deletion. I waited a week before I finally got anything. It was an email from a flyer talking about a new attraction, opening at midnight this Friday. The Great Beyond, it was called, and it was supposedly a new combination, coaster water ride, to dazzle the senses and throw the family. Nothing like it before or since. Stare into the face of the unknown and watch it stare back. Fun for everyone eight and up. Click here to reserve your place. I did so. One PayPal transaction later, I had the tickets printed out and ready to go. I didn't say a word about it until Ben brought everyone over for their usual after-school Tuesday visit. Then I sprung them on Michael and said he could consider it an early birthday present. Just him and Grandpa. Of course, the idea of going to a theme park, any theme park, and trying out a new ride before any of his friends he had even heard of it, was exactly the kind of thing he'd love. So around 11 that Friday, we got into the car and 
and started the drive out there. We actually had a real conversation on the way there, even if uh, the ride ended up being a complete waste of time. The car ride made it all worth it. Just the idea that he was going made him happy to talk about school, his hopes and dreams, the new skateboarding ramp he set up, the band that he and some friends were thinking of doing, the girl who was encouraging him to do so. Never in my life had I ever thought two tickets would make such a difference. I would have said that the tit chat almost made me miss the turn, but it was actually a combination of that and something else. The main sign was shut off. It was a little odd to advertise some big event and not even keep your main sign lit up, wasn't it? Maybe they just wanted to keep things quiet, nobody wandering in off the street. But it wasn't like the road up here was exactly hopping anyway. This place wasn't exactly on the beaten path, with even the interstate a single-lane road in either direction. We pulled into the parking lot, though, and I was surprised by the number of cars. There had to be at least a hundred here. So, the event was a bigger deal than I thought it was going to be. We parked, got out, and saw a few people ahead of us, heading through a darkened gate. Again, most of the lights were off, but it seemed like there were some park employees with a flashlight up ahead waving them in. We got up there, and it was definitely a security guard. But his dress was a little more antique than I expected. It looked like a police officer uniform from the 40s, with a hard-brimmed hat, white gloves, and pressed slacks. He waved the flashlight mechanically up the way. I walked up to him. Hi, this the way to the new ride? His eyes swiveled to me, but otherwise he didn't move. Please stay on the path. The main park is closed. Please get on the ride in an orderly manner. Not exactly the kind of tone that I would expect from a family fun park, but at least he didn't sound angry. Actually, he didn't sound like anything at all. It was monotone that I would expect from somebody who didn't expect to be working tonight and realized he was only going to get a few dollars for it. We walked through the park, past more waving security guards and rides that were closed down and marked off by barriers, until we came to what appeared to be a building with a small tent up in front of the doorway. It had to be the entrance. It was the only thing that had lights on in front of it. If you could call a couple of tiki torches jammed into the dirt, lighting it. Based on the cars in the parking lot, the crowd seemed to be about the size I expected, and we were at the tail end of it. Most of the group appeared to be thrill seekers, teenagers mostly. But the group in front of us was a small family, a husband and wife, with a daughter I thought might have been a bit younger than eight. She smiled and waved at us, but hid behind her father's leg when Michael waved back. For a brief moment, it made me sad that Ben and Maria were likely not to have any more. I may have wished that we were closer, but Michael was still a good kid and would have made a great older brother. The line didn't seem to be moving, but after a few more minutes of waiting, and no one coming after, I realized that they must have been waiting for everyone to arrive before opening the doors. Even from the back at the end of the looping line, we could hear a clacking sound as the metal doors opened and revealed a darkened interior. The line finally began to move, and we entered. When we got in, a security guard came from behind us and slammed the door shut. Michael and I had seen him coming, but the little girl in front of us screamed, which made everyone else in line chuckle nervously. But we all sat in darkness for a little bit before we heard footsteps on what was likely a catwalk above us, clacking and clopping overhead and stopping just above the middle of the line. Would I have your attention, please? A booming voice then clapped its hands several times, loud enough to drown out even the small mumble from the crowd below. A light came on from above, far above, down to the graded catwalk, and the strange fellow who stood there. He wore a white suit with red stripes on the pants, had hair just above shoulder length, and a very waxed and curled mustache and goatee, and enough white grease paint and black eyeliner to 
make members of KISS jealous. Thank you all for coming out this evening. We hope you have a marvelous time on the great beyond. But be forewarned, now that you've stepped foot onto the ride, there's no turning back. The only way out is forward. With this line, he lifted a cane, that he had apparently pulled out of nowhere, and pointed it like a finger at the far wall, where the line began, and a light switched on at that as well. The door had to have been at least ten feet tall, and bent at the top like the prow of a ship. The outer edge was all wood and had symbols carved into it. Along with it, there were skeletons of little demons or lost souls, all horned, smiling with their eternally visible teeth. What a show, eh, Michael? This place is great, Grandpa. Can't wait to get on. The carnival barker, or whatever he was trying to be, now raised his cane up high. Let the first souls be allowed to board. The giant door cracked open, and through it, we could see a roller coaster seat, along with a multitude of swirling lights, howling wind noises, and what appeared to be a graphic of a raging sea along the sides of the wall in the next room. The first group, including a guy in a faded Usher t shirt, excitedly jumped in. Another one of those security guards. Pushed down the straps, and the ride began. We could hear the group starting to scream almost immediately as they left the view. So, whatever this ride did, it got started with a bang. In the line ahead of us, while they waited for the next coaster to come by to board, people started trying to talk to the man on the catwalk up above, trying to make conversation or heckle him. He would occasionally look down at the crowd and make small talk and fake evil laughter. But mostly, he just paced back and forth, slowly, watching everyone go in. All the showmanship he had when he walked in seemed to evaporate as if he was just waiting for the ride to get over with. His script probably still needed some work. The next group got on the coaster, then another, and it was when the fourth came up that I started to have my questions. The Barker, who, as I said, was so quiet after his opening remarks, suddenly pulled out what I thought was a phone, but I couldn't see what it was. All I know is it lit his face with a glow. Oh, ho, oh, folks! You're not going to want to get into the next seats? Seems the demons forgot to clean this one out first. A coaster pulled up, and I heard the family next to me gasp and cover their little girl's eyes. The coaster itself looked like all the others, save for the collection of bloodstains coating it. The riders themselves had been reduced to husks of their former selves, a pile of skinless roasted gore in the seats. Steam rose from the melted skeletons, reaching out as if they were trying to make for mercy or escape. It would have been great effects except for three things. One, for a ride doing a sneak preview, Steam seemed a little bit much. Secondly, though it was heavily obscured by smoke effects in the darkness, I could still see Usher's face printed on a t-shirt. That could still be coincidence, or intentional, if the first riders were park employees and they wore similar clothes to a dummy ride sent through. But again, why put effort in on a coaster that didn't have anyone riding it? It was a waste of electricity, even if it was very powerful effect. But the third thing that struck me was that the original email was for eight and up. This was definitely false advertising. I could tell even Michael was a little unnerved, and he didn't get scared by anything. The family picked up the little girl. Come on, honey, you don't have to ride it. We're going. They excused themselves and pushed past to the door. We came through and pushed it open. Or at least they tried to. Instead, the door shuttered and stayed shut. The father tried it about six or seven times, before the barker piped up again. Sir, excuse me. I said before there was only the way forward. With his cane, he pointed to the open door as the coaster with the body slowly pulled ahead. My kid can't ride that. 
It's way too scary for her. There's only forward. With that, the Barker grinned. A horrible grin. It stretched on his face, far beyond what should have been possible. The others in the room now began to panic, pushing backward away from the large door. That was when more of those guards came around the inside, grabbing people, lifting them with little effort, cramming them down into the seats of the waiting coaster, slamming the safety bars on them so hard and cruelly that bones could be heard snapping. Michael and I looked at each other. In moments, we were both fighting to kick down the door, to break whatever was keeping it closed. If it were locked or chained or something heavy, was placed in front of it. The family with the little girl also kept at it, the father slamming his shoulder into it, and several others were doing so. The door still didn't give. The guards still came, grabbing more and more screaming people and loading them into the ride. I did not know what that ride led to. I did not want to. There were now fewer people left to choose from, and we were no closer to getting the door open. I looked around, seeing nothing in the room that would help. If we were outside still, we could have gotten one of the line poles and tried to smash the door down. But there's nothing like that in here. Just a line marking on the floor. I looked up at the Barker, who stared at the ceiling high above. Arms outstretched, his laughter now full and loud, carrying nothing but heartless evil at its bottom. I turned to Michael to tell him to look for an exit. It was no longer there. Horrified, I thought maybe a guard had grabbed him when I wasn't looking, but no, they still carried others away to certain doom. Then I saw a shape climbing a pole on the far side of the room, one that was within reach of the catwalk. I didn't even have time to contemplate what he was thinking when a guard came and wrapped his arms around my shoulders and squeezing me with malevolent power. He grabbed the father and the mother screamed for the little girl, whose name I finally heard is Georgia, to run and hide wherever she could. Slowly, inevitably, all three of us were dragged toward that infernal door, and the last of the guests to be sent into that chamber. I didn't want to see, but I looked anyway. The swirling light and howling winds were not created by some machine, but the platform on which we stood hung over an abyss. We were still under the spell that this was all just a ride. It would have looked like a truly fine illusion. A trick of special effects wizardry that would make one wonder just how it was all accomplished. But I knew better. This thing was a waiting maw, a sea of waves along which a roller coaster track flowed in and out of some hellish spray of liquid. I could almost see hands reaching out of it grasping for those unlucky enough to be sent on in their merry way into the depths. The coaster then plunged into the middle of this twisting mess, though where it ended up I thankfully had no vision. The next coaster arrived, despite this one being sparkling clean, almost garish in its appearance. I could still smell burnt, awful, clinging to its surface, what our physical bodies would be turned into. But whatever happened to our souls, completely in question. I didn't hear the screaming coming from me, both from the horror of the sight and the sounds of the tempest, but I could feel it erupting from me. I was pushed ever closer to the cars, but I fought and struggled regardless if it would do anything. I would not allow myself to be put willingly on that ride. I would fight with whatever strength I had left in me, I heard a different yelling, something above the maelstrom, something full of hatred and surprise. I tried to turn back and look at it, but the guard held me too tightly, lifting the safety bar with no effort at all. I watched as the mother and father were both loaded into the car next to me, looking at each other in tears, clutching to each other, even as the safety bar came down, crushing and pinning them together. I could do nothing to help them now, but I hoped and prayed that the trauma would kill them before they reached the other side. I was lifted bodily into the air and placed into the seat. The guard went to lower the safety bar and suddenly stopped. He turned and 
something smashed him across the face. Even as it toppled to the ground, it remained quiet and emotionless. Beyond its crumpling form, I saw Michael reaching out to me. He had scratches on his face, but the boy was alive. I took his hand and saw what he carried in the other, the cane of the carnival barker. Barker himself remained on the catwalk, but what he truly was was now hidden in the darkness, the light only revealing flashes of something hulking with a large, misshapen mouth, glowing green eyes, and talons. It stared at the two of us with a baleful look, howling in anger at the loss of its toy. We went back into the room, running at top speed at the entrance door, Michael wheeling back to smash it open. With barely a tap, the cane sent the doors flying open, breaking the spell that held it tight. We heard another scream from behind us, but not that of a creature. Georgia sat in a corner covering her ears and eyes as one of the guards hulked towards her. Michael spun the cane at the guard, and as I scooped her up in my arms, we dashed for the open door. We ran down the lit path as more guards came from the attractions around us, reaching with zombie-like grace. The park is closed. You should not be here. That was what they all said. One got too close, Michael cracked it across the face. It wheeled back at us from the blow. Its face had torn, hanging loose and rubbery from an entirely different face underneath. The meat there was raw, oozing, laced with mechanical wiring and parts, forming some sort of hellish cyborg. It continued to spew its repeated phrase. The closer we got to the parking lot, the more there seemed to be and the faster they seemed to move. We got to the front gate to see that several guards stood in the way of the entrance and exit pathways. Behind us, the mob of them was getting closer. I knew what I had to do. I placed Georgia on the ground and gave Michael the car keys. Go through the ticket booth and around them. I can't fit through there. I'll keep them occupied. Tell your dad I love him. Michael didn't want to leave, but I think he knew there was no choice. He did give me the cane, though, to hold them back, as he took Georgia with her. That part of the plan worked perfectly. None guarded the booth, and they were able to slip past the guards and run off. I waited inevitably for my part in the story to end as the guards, whatever hell spawn they were, closed in, whether to take me back to that awful ride or simply ripped me limb from limb right there. To be fair, I didn't quite understand what happened at first. I knew they were surrounding me, closing me in, ready to claim their prize, and when the light on them got brighter, I thought that was just some trick of my mind or some internal mechanism springing to life. Then the sound of splintering wood and shattering glass, and then several of them went flying. I was knocked over as well, as something bumped me in the hip, but looked up to see my car, the headlights smashed, and the front much worse for wear, but a thankful sight nonetheless. Get in, Grandpa. I have no idea how to drive this thing. I have never felt more useful in my life. I got in as Michael moved over, keeping Georgia on his lap, as I backed the car over a few more guards, as I spun around it, driving it out of that accursed place. We were on the road ten minutes before I dared to breathe normally. Nothing seemed to be following us. I watched as both Michael and Georgia fell asleep on the seat next to me. I pulled into a gas station once we reached civilization and made a call to the police. I didn't want to sound like a maniac, despite what we had all clearly seen and witnessed, but I told them that something had happened out at the Thunder Alley Park. I still had the email on my phone and told them whoever had organized this event had tried to murder people at the park. The next few days were a whirl. The police came to the house asking questions, especially about poor Georgia. They took her away with them to ask what had happened to her parents. She told them that the carnival man and his friends had taken them. It was truth enough for them to buy. The park was under investigation for quite some time and we watched the local news to see what we could find out. Turns out, the week the email was sent, the park had actually been closed for maintenance 
before returning to operation. The building with the ride? Simply a pavilion building for guests to hold birthday parties and picnics. There was indeed a catwalk with lighting equipment for DJs to use for larger events. There was no sign of the door that led into that other realm. There wouldn't be anything that would lead to it anyway. But they did find evidence of something. Blood. Lots of it. It wasn't a large town, so they sent it off for DNA analysis. But so many different results came back that it would take forever to sort out and identify it all, if they even could. The email, though, was our biggest mystery. Michael asked me where I got the tickets, and I showed him the invitation. He stared at it for a moment. Grandpa, that's not the right website. The real one has a dash in between the words. He was right. I typed it in, and a much more professional website appeared than I had originally found, complete with news about the horrible incident, which would lead to a longer closure than intended. The fake site? No longer up. It led to nowhere except a broken link. Police did try to trace the domain the email came from, but that led to a dead end, too. It was like it routed to some place in Europe and then stopped. It didn't even make sense to the IT people. Routes dead end sometimes, but they never just stop, like they just vanish. Michael and I know what we saw, though. Ironically, as horrible as that was, it did make our bond stronger. Well, between him, me, and Georgia, Ben and Maria, upon hearing her parents didn't make it out, were thinking of adopting her, if possible. I think it would be good for Michael. As I said before, I thought he'd make a great older brother. But as for what we saw that night, I have no idea what it truly was. Was it something from another dimension? Was it demons just hoping to harvest souls? And why in the form of a theme park ride? Maybe they just know we were all suckers in the right conditions. But I've made myself promise to double-check every website I go to now. I'm not ready to be taken for a ride like that again, anytime soon. I hope you enjoyed Taken for a Ride by Seth Paul, as performed by yours truly. If you have enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simply scarypodcast.com slash Seth Paul. That's simply scarypodcast.com slash S E T H dash. P-A-U-L. Be sure to check out the growing Jack Allen series, beginning with Jack Allen and the case of the not exactly rocket. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by BetterHelp. Most anyone can benefit from counseling, both professionals and do-it-yourselfers, whether it's depression anxiety, relationship issues, or any other problems standing in your way. BetterHelp is the tried and true tool to get you up to task again. This is no gimmick, folks. It's professional therapy online. Quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price anyone can afford. And believe me, I understand. I'm more than just a disembodied talking head that tells you bedtime night face the same problems that everyone does, including financial surprises. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist who specializes in your specific needs. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. In short, you'll never be winging it again. Your personal counselor will always be close at hand. No awkward office visits necessary. It's professional help right in your pocket. If you ask me, the most important tool in your arsenal. BetterHelp isn't stuffy psychiatry. It's real, 
professional counseling tailored to your needs. It's more affordable than traditional therapy, and for those who need it, financial aid is available. Therapy is no longer an indulgence for the insured or upper class. Thanks to BetterHelp, therapy is for everyone. It's never been easier to care for your mental health. All you have to do is take the first step. Over one million people are using BetterHelp to get a handle on their problems. So many, they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So why struggle? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Otis Jari's Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash horror. That's BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsor. Read his tale of terror, along with 29 other authors, in the Chilling Tales Anthology, Volume 1, available on Amazon. As a reminder, if you decide to give tonight's talented author's stories a read, please consider leaving him a quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. Be sure to let him know that you heard about him on this program, and that Otis Jarry sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure he would much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this product and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month. Get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Chirey. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep if you can. <laughs>
I just can't seem to stop. It's easy to play anywhere you are, whether it be in the men's library, <laughs> while you're waking up in the morning with a good cup of coffee, or even during the lulls of a mundanely busy day. We've got a mystery on our hands, folks. Download June's Journey, and you can have that mystery in yours as well. If you don't have to believe me, try it for yourself. I challenge you to download and play to level two. I'm confident you won't be disappointed. Ready to awaken your inner detective? Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Gyrie. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>